So uh, Mike Willeman is uh, to my right, and John Lefterakis is uh, to my left. They are with two different law firms, but together they are uh, co-representing Brian Flores in his case against the Giants, his case against the Broncos, and, of course, the Clax action suit against the NFL. So I appreciate you guys coming in. Make sure the mics are up, fellas, please. Uh, it's good to meet both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, having, for having us. Uh, I guess, John, I'll just start with you. First off, just so I know from my background, uh, what's your guys' connection prior to this to Brian? Or did he yellow page, white page, let me find no, no, no. a couple reputable law firms? So so my firm, my, myself, I have uh, a longstanding relationship with Coach Flores with Brian. Okay. Uh, we went to school together at Brooklyn's Poly Prep. Three Poly Prep guys, yeah, all right. a little older than me, but, uh, you know, we have a real tight-knit group from Poly Prep that – we're just, we're like brothers. So, you know, I have my firm, a left the rackets, a left the rackets in panic downtown Manhattan. We have about 40 lawyers, um, you know, and we all follow each other's careers. And, you know, Brian reached out to me when he got the text message. So that's where it starts. The yeah. Belichick text message. Now, I can just uh, move your mic down so I can sure. put it right but did he, as, a, as a pal of his, had he, had he ever talked to you about, you know, different job interviews he'd gone on, his experience as a candidate for a head coaching no, job? No, not really professionally like that. Friends, admiration, see right. each other, go down to games. Um, you know, a lot of respect. My firm, we do a lot of, uh, you know, civil rights work on top of injury work. So, you know, we brought the national class action against Macy's uh, where Rob Brown uh, was discriminated against. And he's also a classmate of Oz. So he was reaching out at that time and some right, other so, cases. So let's get, let's, I, I want to do this as best we can chronologically mm -hmm. so people f understand kind of the cases you guys see it. Uh, and there are times, you know, I'll argue with you to play devil's advocate because mm -hmm. I do think there is another side of it, of course. The Giants are going to have a side. The NFL is going to have a side. So for the sake of presenting this as fairly as possible, just please understand that sure. going into it. So it, it begins for you guys and for Brian where he believes at first that he's going to have a legitimate shot at the New York Giant head coaching job prior to the Belichick text message. Was there any uh, conversations that he's made you guys aware of in which he talked directly to either John Mara, Steve Tisch, or Chris Mara, who are usually the three men in the room when they interview prospective coaches? So let me just say this, Craig. You know, this has started before the text messages and, and the conversations. I mean, you look at the complaint, the stuff that was alleged against Denver and his issues in Miami all started before. But... You know, him coming to the realization that he's got to stand up and do something, yeah, that started when the text message came. But, yeah, yeah he was, and you could see in the complaint, he was communicating with John Mara, reach, who reached out and, and told him, you are, you know, the number one candidate. You know, we'd so love John to bring Mara you home. John Mara called him? Yes, th about 30 minutes after Joe Judge got fired. So Judge gets fired, Mara reaches out, Brian, you're my guy. Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. And then, just out of curiosity... Why wasn't, as far as you know, an interview scheduled right away at that point? Why did we wait so much time before they actually interviewed him? I don't know why. Usually that's, that's you know, the team's uh, scheduling. You know, okay. I know, I know, I know that they wanted to obviously do their and conduct their GM search first, yep. which took up a lot of time. And the interview really didn't come that long after uh, Shane, Shane got hired. Job. So he gets hired. Um, obviously, they interviewed... Dayball, I think, um, virtually. So Saturday. Did a Zoom on like prior a, to yeah. the days Chiefs before game. that yeah. week, yeah. yeah. All, right, so, all right, so John Maurer personally reaches out to Brian and says, you're my number one guy. Mm -hmm. Want to yes. bring you home. Yes. That type of stuff. Essentially, yeah. All right. When, when, Dayball, when Joe Shane gets hired, did his view of the job go from, well, maybe they're not going to hire me because he knows, well, Dayball worked with Joe Shane. Did that change how he thought this I, would go? I mean, there are no guarantees. I don't think Brian... Uh, would ever express, I'm, and obviously I can't get into his mind, and he hasn't expressed it to me, but I don't think there was an expectation that there was a guarantee that's not what he's saying. Right. Okay. It's not what the lawsuit's about. But a fair and equal process. How do you go from, you know, the lead guy, the number one guy, top candidate, to a, a job being offered to somebody else before you even step in the building for an interview? I mean, so it's, what is he? So he gets the text message from Belichick. Michael, let you jump in on this. And I assume it blows his world up because he, it's very obvious that Belichick thinks he's talking to Brian Dable and not Brian Flores, right? That's correct. And and that was certainly something for him that at first you know, he thought Belichick might have had information that would have suggested that he, Mr. Flores, was going to get the job, right? right. Um, 
And then it dawned upon him after Mr. Belichick talks about, well, Bill Belichick talks about speaking with the Bills and the Giants. Maybe this guy doesn't know who he's talking to. Right. Um, and so that's why you right. see a little bit later that text message, you know, are you talking to, to Brian Dable or are you talking to Brian Flores? And then, of course, the, the Belichick text message saying that. Was exactly. there ever a thought, and I, I loved his answer this morning because I would think the exact same way of, I can get this job anyway, even if they've already decided on someone else. Was there ever a thought of not going on the interview? There was a thought, absolutely. Did you advise him to do it? Um, we talked it out. We talked it out. You know, there's there's a lot of different there's a lot of di- different factors at play. First of all, he's just the type of guy who's always gonna gonna you know push forward. Right. Um. And he's he's a focused guy, cerebral guy. So he wanted to go put his best foot forward anyway. And you know, there's like he said, and he said it all day. You know, a sliver of hope. But you know, on the other side of it, you know, as a black coach, I mean, look at look at how the Dolphins have defamed him and flipped everything around. Uh, you know, and and made him out to be, oh, this is a guy who's difficult to work with. This is essentially an angry black man situation. I mean, that's a that's well, what they, it is. Call I, it what I it don't is. agree with that part. They well, muddied the waters for him. Well, I wouldn't it's call also, him that also they're, they're, they're I, orga- I wouldn't call him that either. But essentially, what are they saying? Well, well and they also the waters they're, for sure. They're an organization that never had back to back winning seasons in eighteen years. Brian Flores was the coach that made that happen. Brian yeah. Flores in twenty twenty was considered for coach of the year. Twenty twenty one, I mean, he rallied a group. From one and seven to win seven straight and and eight out of the last nine sweeping the Patriots. All right, let me get. Back, I want to get back to just the to the the case and the mm-hmm. specific case against the Giants first, and then the larger case was important. We'll get to that as sure. well. So you guys did have a conversation that hey, I have too much pride, whatever the case may be. I'm not going to that interview. I know they've already hired Brian Dable. You know, too much self respect. I'm not going to do it during the interview because it's not a 20 minute interview. Are you aware at any point him saying to the Giants hierarchy of brass, "Hey, rumor has it that you've already agreed on Dable. Have you uh, have you done that? Did he call no, them on it? No, he didn't, and he wasn't going in there to challenge them uh, in that way. He was going in there to conduct the interview as it would be conducted if it wasn't a sham. And does he feel as if it was that the interview was straight? Like, did um, the Giants treat him in the manner he expected to be? You know the questions they would normally ask. He's been on. I think. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. Right. He's. I don't think he's. He's. He. I, I. I mean. I have. I don't have his exact response in this. So, but from you know just just playing it out, I don't think it was the way it went in Denver with respect to how they came in disheveled and effectively smelling of alcohol, reeking of alcohol. Right. But, so he feels like the Giants actually, whether or not they had an agreement with Dable. The Giants didn't totally disrespect him by going through a BS interview. Well, well, is, well, wait a second, wait a second. Let's not dress it up. It was they they humiliated him. So it, you know, I don't know whether you you you're telling me they're they're good actors or they they dedicated eight hours to pretending that they were going to do him a favor and not just go in there drunk. Yeah, I guess if that's what you call you know. Well, that's what I'm asking. Respect. I'm saying like the actual interview he did. We can all agree that I wasn't it, I wasn't there, but I, I I can't agree with just because they went in there and asked him a few legitimate questions that they were showing him any respect or anything that resembles you know the 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 approach that and the consideration that would rise to the level of having an equal opportunity. God, man, but he did I, not feel the same way he felt about the Denver experience. That's fair it. To was say. not the same experience. I got um, it. They came at him a different way, but. No matter how you slice it, it was humiliating there. It was humiliating with the Giants. What, so, what do you need to? Because sh- the ch- the Belichick text message, as you said, changed everything. What do you need to show to prove that they truly did make that decision before ever interviewing him? Well, well ultimately, we're going to end up in litigation in this case, right? And we're going to be seeking documents, text messages, instant messages, and all sorts of communications. And it's clear that these individuals communicate via text message. And I suspect that we're going to find a lot more evidence of this decision. But it's already been reported by other sources as well. There it's was Jimmy Randazzo there. that came out and said that this decision had been made on Monday, the week that uh, Mr. Flores interviewed just a few days after that. Right. And then uh, Boomer Esiason. Uh, yeah, we, talk, we, we talked about it. Oh, no, we heard that. Well. Yes. Yeah. Boomer, so, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think this was any sort of secret, which in, in a lot of ways makes the situation... I mean, it makes it an absolutely terrible situation, even even all the more worse, because it's behind the scenes, people knowing, but not You're him. Right, but my, my question is, 
do you have to have contact between the agent and the Giants negotiating a deal, or is it just, no. hey, we've made the decision no. or we're leaning away? They, no. I mean, if their mind was made up, I think it was clear it's definitive right. proof from the text message. I think the text message is all, all we need. But like you said, other people were breaking it. And, you know, we will continue to question people in the course of discovery. We'll depose Bill Belichick. We'll, and, and, we'll, but but let's, ask, let's ask the bigger question. Why is Bill Belichick have this information? I, That's a great question. Like, what are well, we talking the, about? The, we all know the answer Why? to that. Because Why does we know, Bill have the Because attention? we no longer live in a society where people keep their lips tight. People like sharing information. But why do you have to tell Bill Belichick? Good. Because that's what he's the grand. So let me let me ask you, but let me ask you a question. When can a black I'm not coach? It's right. wait, but that's wait a second. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying yeah. you're saying it's right. But when can when can a black coach or a black executive get in that club? When can they get in the club of having information before it before it breaks? When can they have information and influence to get a get a job? Uh, you know, I mean, or even interview for it. What is the What is the thought process that uh, of all the African American or minority candidates? who we all would agree are deserving of a head coaching position that haven't got one. Brian at least got one. He got a five-year contract for guaranteed money. Not This has nothing to do with this particular case against the Giants, that maybe he's not the right guy to bring this case. After all, he did get an opportunity. What do you say to what, that? What, 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 I, what I say to that is that's ridiculous. Um, you know, the fact that he had a job before means that you can't be discriminated against or not saying that. So, so the fact that, first of all, we didn't even talk about what, what went down in Miami, but what effectively we're saying is that he doesn't even have to be afforded an opportunity to interview. What we're talking about is equal opportunity in hiring and firing practices. Right. You can't have, have separate practices for white coaches and minority not. coaches. Of course not. So, so when are white coaches not afforded an opportunity to be hired. I mean, we have one black coach in the entire league. Which is obnoxiously league. wrong. But, but this, these are things that need to be the focus. You know, everybody, when these situations break, routinely f try to find an argument or something to hang their hat on. You know, we have people who just try to get behind a position because they can relate to an organization. Eli Manning, I just saw a statement where he comes out and he co-signs the Giants without being involved in the process and knowing nothing. Well, how would he possibly do that? How, why would you issue a statement? He shouldn't have said anything. Can you guys grab me the Eli Manning statement? Yeah, he basically said, I know the Giants so, didn't do anything wrong, so but the, I wasn't in the, so I wasn't the, in the room. So the point is, as, know? as a society, <laughs> let's, so let's support what, what's right and proper, and let's get against what what shouldn't happen. Well, yeah, here's the thing. I think we can all agree on this, and this is my take. I, I'm sure I could be wrong. The New York Giants agreed that Brian Dable was going to be their head coach Three days before Brian Flores walked into their offices, I don't think that's really up oh, for debate. No doubt. So let no me doubt. ask you this: So, I, I just so don't. would you agree that let's? I let, think that happened. It, oh, agreed, it did happen. Yeah. But let's talk about this. What about the fact that there is a rule, the Rooney Rule, which yeah. which doesn't work? Admittedly, Clearly. three black coaches when it was when it was enacted, and now there's one. So the Rooney Rule doesn't work. Obviously, good intentions. But what do you say to the fact that? They had not even complied with the Rooney rule before. Yeah, you know, I think, listen, obviously it's a problem. I'm sure they're not the only team that tries to skirt it. And whether you fine them or take draft picks away, it ultimately doesn't change. Because if it had, there'd be more than one black coach uh, in the NFL. So When I, Brian first came to you, mm -hmm. here's a guy who's a very proud man, literally came from nothing in Brownsville, Brooklyn, I saw the video that, of all people, the Dolphins put out a number of years ago when he was first hired. And his story is, it's the great American success story. Literally, his mom wouldn't let him leave their small apartment in Brownsville to play because she feared for his life as a young boy. They say a rose uh, grew from the concrete. Right. I mean, it's the video is worth seeing. I was very moved by it. And I have great respect for his story. Making a decision to sue the NFL, to sue the Giants, the Broncos, etc., to me, is also career suicide, and I wonder. It may be. I think. I mean, I know the Texans think very highly of him. I think it'd be hard for the Texans to hire him today. But that being said, did you guys, especially since you're friends with him for Absolutely. a long time, did you guys have a lengthy conversation about, hey, we're gonna go do this, but let's just understand the shrapnel to your career. I mean, Brian is a cerebral guy. Brian thinks everything through. We absolutely spoke about it. Um, and and he knew that in doing this, he may be sacrificing his entire career for a greater good, which, you know, I don't know who can't get behind someone who can, no, I'm great. Who can do I that. I personally have great respect for it. I'm just wondering how much you guys went back and forth, not just as his lawyers, 
But as a friend, yeah, they, I mean, hey, you, listen, just understand what you're getting into. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is this is heavy. I mean, look at just what broke today. I mean, it gets lost on people that that this man is not just a this this man is not just a robot. I mean, he has a wife. He's got three little kids yep. who watch TV, watch the news. We were in the green room um, at CBS this morning, and he's on a, a call with with his daughter, and she says, "Daddy, did you get a job yet?" I mean, that's mm. the type of stuff that when we sit here and we see this on TV, and people try to get behind something, they miss the fact that his wife has to read right. you, all you know he, negative things. Of is and he it, is he still? Because I mean, maybe I'm being naive here. I would hire him in a second. He's so a hell of a head I. coach. I mean, is he still in line to interview with the Saints again, in, with he, the no, Texans? No, he What's interviewed. The interviews are done. They went very well. And what now? He had a great rapport with Mickey Loomis in, in New Orleans. Right. Um, he had a, a, a great interview with Nick Casario. What have they said and, since? Um, since they're, you know, obviously Brian alerted them before filing. So, right. You know, obviously, respectfully. So he made both their teams aware, listen, I'm filing yes, a suit. Yes, bef- yes. You just got to know And he it. said, I'm, I am still want to be considered. Right. I could still lead your football Wait, team. So th- he went for the interviews prior to yes. informing them yes. of the lawsuit. Yes. I, how have they responded since to then? They- um, I, don't, I don't believe uh, New Orleans responded. Um, I think he's had a subsequent conversation with Houston, but nothing, nothing about the lawsuit. Well, is, must- is it your impression? that they're not going to hire him. I I can't make that determination. I mean, you know, that's that's for them internally to discuss. I mean, listen, one thing I know about Brian, Brian wants to work again, even though he understands the risk. He wants to work, but the the reality is he's going to be happier to know that whoever gives him a shot, obviously their values are in line with who he is and and support what he did to champion a cause, not just for himself, but for an entire, you know, race. I can tell you who's not getting the Houston Texan job. Josh exactly. McCown's got no shot at it now. Well, think, like how how pathetic would that be? They, you know, they can't. Listen, oh listen, let's just talk about how ridiculous. <laughs> David Culley gets fired, and Josh McCown, he could be a great quarterback. The guy's coaching high school football. It's a joke. So, it's a so joke. now you hire jo- potentially hire Josh McCown over Brian Flores? Do you, I tell, do you, I, pardon me for a second. I apologize. Yeah. They brought me the Eli Manning quote. The, I mean, this is comical. This is, uh, and Eli, you should know, is still a paid consultant for the New York Giants, of course. Oh, wow. So Eli Manning says this, I was not involved in any of that process in any way, so I don't know the details. But I don't think there was any wrong. You're right. I mean, come on, then keep your mouth well, shut. Man. What are you talking about? <laughs> but, but that's what we do in society. Oh, we'll, people co-sign things with no people right. are, are parroting. Brian is difficult to work with. With no investigation, well, no, no. Well, he and Chris Greer didn't get along. That's well known. Chris Greer is also a terrible general manager. That, I'm saying that's not I'm a one-way so street. They didn't like each other. I know, but but, 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 but how does that make Brian difficult right. to work with? No, the problem the is, as a football fan, I know the Dolphins suck. Yeah. And I know that their GM's done a terrible job, and I know that that owner's been incompetent. And I know as a Jet fan, I like the Dolphins, that they've been good the last two years. I know that. We're talking to I know uh, he's a good head coach. John Elefterakis and Mike Willman, are, are other, they're the lawyers that represent Brian Flores. Go ahead. I apologize. No worries. Are there other... Because Brian, Brian, for him to do this, is obviously very brave, as we've talked about. Are there other coaching candidates that are going to join in and say, I dealt with sham interviews, I dealt with this, I'm joining in. Do you have others ready to join? We certainly expect so. Um, we've been in contact with a lot of coaches, a lot of people that were candidates for jobs that they didn't get, um, whether from a coaching level, executive level, um, down to you know front office and the NFL level. I mean, we've received a lot of calls in the last number of days, um, or rather in the last like 24 hours. Sure. Um, Brian's obviously connected with a lot of people who have experienced similar things. And when you look at what has happened in the last 24 hours, which I think is – is almost as interesting as the suit itself. You've got virtually every black former player, executive coach, et cetera, coming out, acknowledging that this that this exists. Right. And then you've got the NFL that on a 60-page complaint with hundreds and hundreds of allegations comes out in an hour and <laughs> says the whole thing is meritless. I was going to ask you about that. What yeah. was, uh, <laughs> I mean, we, we laughed at that saying, I mean, it, it's so flippant to do that. I assume... You guys thought that was crazy. Well, well, what's amazing is that the NFL has repeatedly acknowledged when it behooves them that they do have a problem. I mean, the Rooney Rule came out of at least a purported recognition of a problem. Right. You've got Troy Vincent, Troy Vincent. Um, who's, who's an executive at the NFL, saying that black coaches are subjected to a double standard. Um, and you've got the chief diversity officer um, at the NFL saying that 
this is a problem that is our responsibility and our fault. And the first time within moments of being called out by a specific person on a specific set of events and having their whole history laid out in front of them without any introspection, thought, investigation, or consideration whatsoever, they say it's completely meritless. I mean, right. that is just but unbelievable. The, NFL, the hubris of the NFL, but, which is why I don't think you're going to depose a single person or see the inside of a courtroom on this at all. At some point when it gets ugly enough for them, they're going to call you up and say, all right, what's it going to take? How big a check am I writing? Well, I can, tell you, I, say, I, I can tell you, sorry, just uh, real quick, it's... It's not going to be just a check that resolves this case, and that's really important because, as, as and I think this gets back to your question, why is Mr. Flores the right guy? Why is Brian yeah. the right guy? It's because he was willing to do this. He could have gotten a check. He could have gotten a check from whether he got an assistant coach job, whether he would, could have kept himself in candidacy for right. some of these other jobs. He was not going to not work again. He's 40 years old. This is someone who is willing to step up and say, I'm going to forego that check or at least risk that in order to make change. And he said all morning, and he said to us the last number of days in deciding this, that the NFL is at a crossroads. There's right. a fork in the road here. And in order to resolve this case, in order to avoid those depositions and that discovery and that trial, they're going to need to commit to real meaningful change. And it starts with the ownership. If the so, Giants came out and said, you know what? We messed up. We messed up. We we, we had great respect for Brian. We, he was a legitimate candidate. Yeah. John Marriage, you said... Reached out to him a half hour after Joe Judge got fired and said, want to bring you back home, you're my number one guy. If the Giants come out and said, you know what, in retrospect, we goofed here. Um, we're happy with Dayball, but we didn't do it the right way, and uh, we're sorry about that. Would he drop the suit against them? Never. Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is bigger than one situation, and there's going to be more people in this class, as we just talked about. I yeah. mean, we're talking to coaches. This is, the, the, it's not going to happen. There needs to be real change now. The time is now. I mean, this is a moment, and I think he understood that with the risk, that that this is a moment that we're looking for real change. He's looking for real change. Right. So it's not just going to be, hey, I'm sorry, you know, let's let's you know spray some Febreze on the stink right. and, and, and move on. Not happening. Well, one of the, the big other big accusations is Stephen Ross yep. offering him money to lose games. Can we time do out? You guys, like, do you guys have a minute so we can take a quick break? And let's then get do into it. That? Is that cool? Let's do it. All right, we'll take a very quick break. On the other side of the break, uh, we continue on with Mike Williman and Jeff Lefterakis. Uh, we're, they are the lawyers representing uh, Brian Flores. Did I mess the name up? John Lefterakis. What did I say? Jeez, man. I'm what getting, did I call look you? Look at this. What did look, I call Jeff. You? All of a sudden, Jeff. I became Jeff. I disagree with you for two minutes. Yeah. Well, I'm Jeff. You Jeff. You Come got on. a brother? <laughs> Nick. I got a brother, Nick. Not John, Jeff. <laughs> John Lefterakis. I do apologize for that. Uh, obviously, the, the other part of the story, which in a lot of ways is even bigger, is the notion that Stephen Ross uh, wanted to fix the outcome of games uh, so that they could maybe get Joe Burrow. So we're going to get into that in depth uh, with these guys uh, in just a moment. All right, welcome back. Carton and Roberts on the fan. Mike and John, not Jeff. Just want to make sure I get that right. <laughs> He's now known as Jeff forever to his friends. You, know, you, guys, you, guys, you guys have killed my day. Someone on the fan earlier talked about my, my split lip yeah, that I got punched punch in the lip. <laughs> now you're calling me Jeff. I mean, it's just the fan. You guys really don't like me, man. Yeah. Jesus Christ. I wonder if your money's any good at Michael's Restaurante now in Brooklyn. It may not be. My, yeah. Always good at Michael's. <laughs> okay. I got to bring you some sauce. Uh, please do. All right, so, uh, so Mike and John here, they represent Brian Flores. Uh, you know, I think we got into the giant stuff pretty well. Yeah, I'm fascinated by this Stephen Ross yeah. thing. And the, the, the number one thing is, do you guys have proof that Stephen Ross said that to Brian Flores? Hey, I'll give you a hundred grand. Let's lose some games. So, so I'm not going to get into everything that we have, um, and the stuff that we will get, but you know, this conversation did happen, you know, and, and Brian's word, who he is, his integrity. I mean, Brian's a no-nonsense, straight shooter. Integrity and character is everything to him. So people's reputations and, and, and people coming forward, that's evidence. That's evidence. But there will be more um, and other people who were involved in this conversation. When, when so was, in other words, there will be other people that can claim to have been in the room when Stephen Ross allegedly said it. Brian, is that what we're saying? Bri Brian informed people when this happened. Say this. No, was I don't mean that. I don't mean like Brian reached out and told friends. Like, no, not friends. Is, organizational. Is there, organizational. Is there a chance that there's a third, fourth, fifth person that would have heard it? That's what I'm asking. I, I'm not saying third, fourth, and fifth, but there were other people in the building who knew about it. Absolutely. And it wasn't it. like a joke. He was being dead serious. Like, here's yeah, the offer. I mean, Brian, lose some games. Brian was being. I mean, and part of the discord in Miami 
was after he didn't tank mm -hmm. and didn't cooperate, I guess, you know, he's an uncooperative guy, right? So after he, he doesn't do these things, the next two years, it's constantly, well, you know, if we would have got the number one pick, well, if we, so it's just constantly brought up. But no, Brian's, this this was a serious conversation. Well, was it said to him, just timeline-wise, was it done early in the season, late I don't, in the I season? Don't, I don't know. And was it said multiple times or was it a one-time thing? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But uh, th there was definitely a vibe in the building that upper management was against him as well to the point where... You know, Brian will tell you he believes it galvanized the team that year. They had they, who did they have? Right. And they were winning games. Have, there was one of the stories I I was told over this past year. I'm not sure if this even came up. Was that a, one of the big disagreements that he had? One of the reasons he and Chris Greer don't get along at all is that Brian was in favor of bringing Deshaun Watson in, and uh, the owner was as well. Chris Greer wasn't, and that was a lot of the back and forth that created some kind of animus between them. You know. I'm not going to get into conversations and stuff that I wasn't a part of, but what I'll what I'll say is that Chris Greer has been the general manager of a losing team, the only winning team when Brian was there, but a losing team for 20 years. You don't become or remain 20 years a general manager of a losing organization unless you do what the owner wants when the owner wants okay. it. So you know, some creating some impression or some thought that. That Stephen and Brian were aligned, and Chris Greer. No, no, it's Stephen, Chris. You know, and, then and Brian. yeah, I mean, there's what a reason he's the, there 20 years. The notion that you guys also put out that in 2019, Steve Ross wanted Brian to accidentally bump into an unknown player, which I believe <laughs> is Tom Brady, uh, at a marina or on a yacht or something like that, <laughs> to convince him. Hey, yeah. So there, there were, there were, there were. Can I? Can we agree? It's Tom Brady. I cannot neither, neither <laughs> agree right. or it's deny. I mean, I said yes. I can neither agree Brady. nor deny. It's but, Tom Brady. Tom Tom Brady. Brady. What what I will say is that you know there was attempts to have a meet with this player, talk of hey, let's meet. You know, and and even before this, he had refused and said no, I won't right. do it. Um, so when this happened, he it pitched as a lunch, and he goes on a boat. Hey, guess who's stopping by? Guess who's a you know? And I'm Tom I'm, parap Brady. I'm paraphrasing. Right. This is these are not quotes. Guess who's stopping by? Brian is a serious guy. Ethics right. matter to him. You know, Brian does not break the rules. And and that's part of the reason why he is such an amazing plaintiff in this. Not just the fact that he's a winning coach and 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 effectively he got, you know, uh, I don't even want to say what, what happened to him. But, you know, it, he's an honest guy. And honest enough to walk off a boat when the owner's there because you don't want to engage in tampering. Right. Did he ever consider resigning from the Dolphins based on these things happening? There's a lot that goes into that. When you help build an organization, and you first of all, you move a family with three kids. Right. So let's not lose that. You bring coaches who have a job. It, it, it could be the. It could be the. It could be any form of coach. You're dealing with with people in an organization where they rely. They get their check on you, um, and what you do. You brought these people here. You bond with the team. You feel responsible. You you're there for these players in a way that they they know and they love you. So it's just not that simple to resign. And and right. and, and he loves to coach. Sure. He's Mike, he's the best at it. Let me ask you this. Uh are you guys now actively trying to recruit other minority candidates who feel as if they were treated in a similar manner, went through a sham interview, uh, were lied to, didn't get opportunities? To embolden the class action part of the case? Uh, I wouldn't use the word recruit only because it's not something that we're going to have to do or or even something that, you know, would necessarily be appropriate for us to do. I mean, what we have is an influx of people who are reaching out to us who have stories that will be added to this complaint, um, individuals who will be added to this complaint. I mean, this lawsuit is going to expand. Um, there's just no question about that. And it's not going to be the result of, of as I think it's important from a legal perspective to just understand the, um, the image that people have of a lawyer going and recruiting people. That's not what we do. We're representing someone right now who is wronged. Other people have recognized that and other people have been reaching out to us. But, so, but today the class action part of it is Brian and John Doe, uh, assuming there's going to be more, correct? Well, the right now, so it, from a, if you want to get into the nitty gritty, which I won't 
do too deeply. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you bring a class action, you only need one representative. And the class itself is going to be, in our view, Popular. certified regardless of how many named plaintiffs we have in this case. If we can prove our case that there's systemic discrimination in the ranks of coach hiring, GM hiring, coordinator hiring, et cetera, then we will be able to prove to a court that it would be appropriate to treat this as a class. Once that happens, notices go out to all of the people, all the candidates who Got were um, – subjected to a failure to hire, et cetera, other types of so things. So to me, this is the NFL's worst nightmare uh, because it's obvious that there's a discrepancy in hiring minorities for specific jobs, both front office jobs with the acknowledgement. I know that two minority men did get hired as general managers here in the last week and a half in the NFL uh, in Minnesota and in Chicago. Um, but also there's one out of 32 jobs that is currently filled by a minority candidate, and he's been there for two decades in Mike Tomlin. So, like, I'm a believer the NFL is hubris to a point, and then they write a check. It's what they do. But you got yeah, you got right? to, you got to get to the next step because— Like, what's the end goal? So, so let me tell you the end goal in a second. But, you know, what, what happens commonly in these things, when you discuss it matter-of-factly or you break it down from one— and you just look specifically at one case or this case— or you try to find a way to rationalize it, a lot of people do it because you want to believe this is not happening. You want to believe people are inherently good. No, this can't possibly be. So we try to find ways to rationalize it, but the reality is the numbers speak for themselves. Right. And we say, oh, yeah, there's two guys here. And it, I mean, the numbers are ridiculous. There's not one qualified man, one qualified black man to be a head coach in the NFL. you got to be kidding me, especially when you're pulling... Who are a lot of coaches, former players? Yep. You're pulling from a pool of 70% minority players. So how do, players. We, how do we fix this we thing? Because the Rooney Rule so hasn't Rooney worked. Rooney we all rule, agree. The Rooney Rule is an idealist type right, thing, right? Right, right? You're assuming you're going to change people's hearts and minds when you just get that person before. But the reality is there's backroom dealings. People want to hire those who look like them, who they're comfortable with, who they view as the face of their but franchise. But so what, what do we do? Because what we you have can't to do is guys and sell. Minority Not just coordinators that. Listen, first. Coordinators, yeah. you have to tie. Unfortunately, to right this wrong, you have to put policies in place, which is what we're fighting for, that can actually bring about change. Tie certain things to hiring. Incentives? And Right. You you can do increased cap space if you give a minority candidate a chance. There's a lot of different things that can be – you can even down to funding an organization that trains, pr provides opportunities, you know, does certain things. I mean, th there's a lot of things, and we're developing the non-monetary changes that we're going to try to enact. Let but, me ask you this. Uh, at any point, did the New York Giants – call Brian Flores after the interview to let him know that they had decided on Dable and to thank him for his time or something along those lines. He they, got he got a call, um, I think, right before they announced on Friday after the Fraser interview. Who uh, called him? I don't know if it was the GM or Mara. I think it might have been the GM. Uh, saying, saying, hey, just wanted to give you a heads it up. It was a quick, um, you know, we're going to go with Dable. And, Peace out. So, yeah. Huh. That <laughs> fascinates me. So and he has not spoken to Belichick since the Texas. No. Not that it would matter, but and 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 again, he? this is not this is not you know Brian dislikes Brian has a lot of respect for Belichick. Well, you he know? worked with him, yeah. yes. But this is the the fact of the matter is just as Brian believes this is bigger than him, it's bigger than Bill too. And Bill uncovered this. This is something he, in the text message that is proof proof positive that this is going on. Right. So you got to use it. If Bill doesn't send that accidental text message, then then this guess isn't what? happening right no, now. It, you know, it's not. It's always been well, happening. No, no, no. We know but, that's but, happening. But, but I mean, Brian saying, "Hey, you know what? You know what happens? It's the same thing that happens to every minority candidate when they don't get a job. They go back with reputational damage. They go back questioning, why aren't I good enough? Why did I miss out? All while it's been rigged against them. So that humiliation, you got to go look at your kids in the face and say. Yeah, dad didn't get the he, job. No, I, I disagree with that. Uh, how you can know, you disagree? It's not with it? always, you know, not getting a job does not always come with humiliation. Uh, the fact in this case it does. It's not just this case. He this knew is, it was a BS interview. Yeah, you know, but it's it's bigger than that, Craig. It's bigger than that. You know, you can't just say that. Okay, in this situation it happened, but there are there are 
people who go for these interviews, whether it's because of the Rooney Rule, and and they're not given the time of day of serious he, consideration. He, I think he mentioned he's been on nine head coaching interviews throughout his career. Mm-hmm. We've heard about the Denver one, yep. how insulting that was, the Giant one, he got the Dolphin one. Did he feel like most of those interviews were shams? I don't, I, you know what? I haven't. The only interviews that I've, I'm aware of and is obviously the Giant one. Are uh, the two that are still outstanding, which is the Saints and Texans. But here's, the Saints right. and Texans, and, and and he knows Casario, so he's got to know him personally for a Casario while. Casario right? was was in New England, was right? Yeah. yeah, so he has to know Nick for sure. Yeah, yeah but he, he wouldn't. Does. I mean, right. bottom line is he probably wouldn't have known the Giants one was a sham had he not gotten Belichick's right. text. Well, I mean, right. correct. That's the point. Right. He would just be humiliated right. and think that you know they would be able to take cover under the. We just decided to go a different way. Right. Now, let me you ask know? this: is the is the suit against the Giants and Broncos? Separate than the class action suit against the NFL, or they inexpl- are they intertwined? They can't be separated. No, they can. So um, he's bringing individual claims uh, against the re- Giants, the Broncos, yes, and the Dolphins, and the Dolphins. Um, and those are examples, but also freestanding independent claims of the widespread problem. Now, the, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just so I have this, I understand the claim against the Giants and the Broncos. They're kind of the same. The uh, lawsuit that uh, names the Dolphins, that's about what, defamation of character? Well, this part of it is, is going to ultimately be because of that. But also, again, discrimination. You've brought a black coach into a job that you've now put in a position where you're telling him he's got to lose. But you're allowed to fire people. So of an, course. Right? an article just came down. I just, I'm looking at it on my phone now where Mickey Loomis is quoted as saying, Brian Flores informed us of a lawsuit after a very impressive Tuesday interview. So, okay. You know. Got it. So let me just finish that thought. Like, I can fire an employee. Correct. Right? And pay him. Like, he is getting paid for two more years. So you're allowed to do that without, you know, you haven't broken a law in doing that. Well, well, a couple of things. One, you break the law when you fire someone for a reason that's explicitly unlawful because of, like, for instance, because of someone's race. And so to the extent— And let me ask you, do you think that yeah. they fired him because he's black? That I think that absolutely played a role in it, and because if you look at the way that they treated does, but, him, but does the color of the skin of the GM matter in this? Because Chris Greer is black, or is that irrelevant? No, that's this? a hiding place. That's no, another I'm hiding. I'm asking no, the question. No, 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 Listen, no, a, no, not in a lawsuit, and not, in, and, and you know, that's another hiding place. For, I don't know. That, I think that's the weakest part of everything I've heard today. The weakest part. Yeah. So in what respect they, didn't, what? they didn't fire Brian Flores because he's black. The way that they viewed him as someone because he was not willing to say yes and be a yes man, and well, a tank, and a tam- yeah. like, oh, no, that, no, that's it, why I think they yeah. fired him. Well, well uh, understood, yeah. but but there's a perception in America and a lot of corporate jobs and a lot of NFL jobs that you bring in someone who is black, they should be happy to have a job, and they should follow the directives of the ownership. And at the end of the day, when the, he doesn't do that, that is a different way in which he'd be treated than someone who is white. I, and here's, but let's, here's, let's oh, second, sorry, Mike, one, Mike, one, one thing. Craig, 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 yeah. Craig, let's look at. Let's I think look, you guys are dead in the water wait, on that one. No, and let me let me tell you why we're not. Yeah, go let ahead. me tell you why we're not. Because you look at Coach Flores, and we know reality, right? We can play games and say this didn't happen, but. A lot of times, there aren't bridge coaches where you bring in a black candidate for a year, tank, we're not going to do anything, and then you fire him. Let's look at Brian. Let's look at Hugh Jackson in Cleveland. Let's look at Wilkes in Arizona. No, Wait I think David Culley's a great example. David Culley. One year. So, no, absolutely. So, so okay, yeah. we're going to hire a black coach. We're going to tell him to tank, or we're going to not give him the support he needs. He's going to lose for a year or two, mm-hmm. and then he's out but the then door. He, but then he won. But And then you know he I mean? won, and he screwed up. What the plan was. So, but let's, the plan let's, was two years I'm earlier. Sorry, but he wouldn't get fired because he's black. But let me ask you a question. Sorry. But, but then talk to me yeah. about how Brian Flores, David Cully, Coach Wilson. Cully's a Hugh much Jackson. better story to, to sell me on. Than but how? But how? Because the only Cully thing. Cully was a bridge coach. Everyone so knew when he got they, the job. So, how can you make the claim that yeah. that's not what they intended Brian Flores to be? They fired him after he wouldn't do illegal things, he wouldn't tamper, yeah. and, and he didn't tank. So, what makes Brian the only reason the only the only thing that you can argue is that Brian's not a bridge coach? Why? Because he stayed there three years. Why? Because oh, Brian's they gave away- him a five year contract. No, because right? Brian, it doesn't matter. But you're allowed fire to him. fire people. You're allowed to fire people, but you're not allowed to set them up and not give them real consideration. So let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Do you think, and this is as a fan, not as an attorney, do you think Brian Flores goes in there in two years, loses for two years, okay, and then 
Uh, they 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 get the number one pick. Right. They get Joe Burrow or whatever, whoever sure. they want. Who's coming in? Jim Harbaugh now to, to go win three know, Super Bowls? But, uh, he didn't get fired. Well, but it's speculative. Try, like, me, you're right. No, that no, could have happened, no, but, but, but it did But at some point, we have to look at the numbers and right. what actually happens. So what your only argument is Brian Flores is too good a coach yes. and won for three years. When, you ever see the movie Major League? Yes. That's what they we, put we him in. And yesterday. Brian yeah. Flores is too good a coach, so that's why the situation, you know, the termination has nothing to do with his race. But there's evidence throughout the league that when you look at, and I just named four in the last three seconds, Wilkes, Jackson, and, and Cully. Cully, yeah. And, and there's not that many black coaches, so let's talk about what the percentage is of that, where these guys come in, they lose. That the initial intention was for Brian Flores to be there for a year it or may two, have been. lose games, tank, get it It may have been, and when right. you put the entire picture together and don't say, ah, oh, come on, this is not really happening. How do you prove, like, I, I get what you're saying, but, but how do you prove we, that? Here, you're you, proving what you we, think we, the well, Dolphins' here, intent Here's was. how you prove it. Yeah. And this is what, just to reframe it a little bit. When we're in discovery in this case, we're going to take discovery of not just the way that Mr. Flores was treated, but the way in which people who are white coaches were treated under similar circumstances. White coaches who did not say yes to everything that their owners asked them to do. White coaches that were supposedly not collaborative. White coaches that were supposedly abrasive or couldn't get along with all the right people. And white coaches, by the way, that, that went and won above and beyond what anyone expected them to do. And what, what we expect to see is that, and we know from the data, is that those white coaches under those circumstances, don't get fired the way that black coaches Absolutely do. Absolutely White not. coaches have a longer tenure than black coaches on average. In the last 10 years, 10 black coaches have been hired by the NFL, and not a single one of them remains employed, as opposed to at least 25% of the white coaches sure. over that time period. So you're going to look not just... You can look at for the Flores situation on its own and in a vacuum, and you could say, you know what, it wasn't race, it was this or that or the other thing. But the way that you prove a legal claim isn't looking at, at only the facts that you have in front of you. It's a comparative process. And you have to look at the way that other white – a white coach that's abrasive is not going to get himself fired after, hit, after hit going 10-6 and 9-7. And and I mean, look at Steve Wilkes and, and Cliff Kingsbury. Steve Wilkes comes in. He, he loses in Arizona, okay, with a GM who gets – basically suspended, and he has no GM, he loses, fired. Cliff Kingsbury comes in, loses a year. Guess what? You get a second year. This can't, this is not coincidence. And and there's this there's there's more to I it. Mean, uh, how many black coaches have been fired after a single year? I can I, name two. I, Steve I, Wilkes and David Cohen. That's all in the last four years. How many years. black coaches are yeah. there? How that's many, that's, that's 90% well, of the black also, coaches. But also, how, also how, many, about, how many coaches, uh, period, have been like, fired, fired after? Now. He, didn't how many, fired, he didn't get fired. No, no, no. no, no forget about Brian Flores. Sorry. You asked the question. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to answer it, too, just as yeah. using my brain here to think. How many coaches, period, have been fired after one year in the last five years? Not a lot. The only two I can think of, and maybe I'm forgetting someone... Are those two? Is Steve I Wilkes and David Cohen? So, Cohen. so Craig, way, Craig, I agree. The hiring practices suck. They're obnoxious. When you say suck, they're racist they're and discriminatory. Yes, Just I, say it. Just say I it. Agree. I want to hear you say it. Come I on. Agree. They are discriminatory, I, I Craig. I agree. I agree Thank 100% you. Thank you. Thank you. that it's a real problem. Thank you. I disagree with this latter argument. Now, let me just, before we let you guys go, this is what the Giants said. We are pleased and confident <laughs> with the process that resulted in the hiring of Brian Dable. We interviewed an impressive and diverse group of candidates. The fact of the matter is, Brian Flores was in the conversation to be our head coach until the 11th hour. Yeah, of Monday night, of three Monday. days before. <laughs> yeah, they, before. Did, they didn't say when, 11th <laughs> yeah. hour of what day. <laughs> Ultimately, we hired the individual we felt was most qualified to be our next head so coach. So most, most qualified, not right. the head coach with too many seasons <laughs> and a possible coach of the year, Sorry. but the, the coordinator. And again, this is not a knock on Coach Dable. As I said, Brian thinks the world of him, and he, he roots for him. Yeah, Dable's in a bad spot on this one because he's he done is, nothing wrong. He is. Yeah. He's, he is. And you know what? That that's that's tough. But you know, he's in a worse spot. Brian Flores. Yeah. Well, listen. But so. he's a trailblazer, and uh, if things go the right way now, he becomes a major historical figure. Well, I also hope for he, change. I also hope he gets the Saints job. I like, hope he gets not? the Saints job He's too. a good coach. He's the um, best. I mean, you win with nothing. You guys and, have you any know? plans? Does Brian have any plans? To show up at the Super Bowl or Super Bowl week, all the media is there. No, you know, listen, Brian, Brian, as I said, is a serious guy. He's not in for spectacles or anything like that. He wants real change. He's going to do it in in the formal process, in, in the ways that, you know, are, are effective, but not a show. He's and not I, a showy guy. I have to ask this question. If his bank records were checked, 
Is there a hundred thousand dollar wire at any time that goes to his bank account from related? Craig, don't even play that Steven way. Ross? This guy, not saying he wanted it, but I have to ask not. The this guy is. So he never was sent the money. Oh, stop! Oh, stop! He also didn't lose the games oh, on stop. purpose. He they un- won their last listen, two games. Listen, listen there's a reason correct. he was fired. He might and have sent it's the money back, unequivocally, <laughs> no. Was n- money not, was never sent. No, he could have sent it back. We are not getting into this. To We're him. going to left field, Craig. But we love you. <laughs> so related never said, "Hey, do you need an apartment in the city?" Nothing like nothing that ever happened. Like listen, that. I think it's time for Jeff. Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, before we let you go, what is just so we know the next step, or do we wait now until? You guys have more people involved so than you. We got. Follow we, more got paper we got. We got assigned. We got assigned a judge. Uh, I'll let Mike get into it, and uh, you know, moving forward, we're getting more class members. Um, well, like, well, just I, I know the court process can take a while. What would be the next or ahead, expected yeah, moment so, when you appear before a judge or something happens? The, the first step in the court process will likely be um, some sort of response to this complaint or an amended complaint that adds additional individuals and additional facts and stories, et cetera. Um, in which case we'll get a response to that complaint. Um, after we get that response, the first court appearance is generally an initial conference where the judge will either discuss any potential motions. The NFL may try to get the case kicked, et cetera. Um, we think they'd be without merit having done an investigation before making that conclusion. Uh, and then the judge will set a schedule for discovery uh, once all those issues are resolved. And forgive me for asking this because at the end of the day, it's none of my business, but I have to ask the question anyway. I know Brian Flores has done well for himself the last couple of years. Uh, I I assume this is like a pro bono case where you guys are trying to represent the greater good here, or is Brian Flores actually engaging with you where he's writing a big check to be represented in this class action case? We're really trying to take it to. Uh, well, I gotta to, uh, ask. Like, you, gotta, you, you gotta ask. You you guys get listen. It's not Mr. bad for your law firms to be involved with it either, Mr. Flores. And I understand that is part of the legal process. So it's a just uh, how does that work uh, Mr. for the class action? Mr. Flores has written us no checks, um, and we don't get. I mean, look, if we make the change we want to make, um, there's no way to cut out a percentage of that. change. That's the win for you guys, us. exactly. Got the it. win, the win is the change for us. Great, there's no doubt about it. Well, listen, I appreciate you guys coming by. And there's a lot, by the way. There's a lot that goes into taking down, you know, and changing no, it's gonna the be, NFL. Listen, it ain't happening tomorrow. We all know that. And you know, this case yeah. ain't getting settled in six months either. This just has legs, and it's going to go for a bit. Unless they do the right thing. Unless they come to the table. Instead yeah, well, of taking the, NFL, so taking the road and denying happened. like they did, they come to the table and they say, they deny what kind it. of changes? They deny it in one breath, but then they also realize they have an issue. Like, they know they have of, an issue. They, they've admitted the issue, but right. then they say no merit without investigating. So, right. you know, they need to do a, a quick about face. If not, then we litigate this thing to conclusion. That's what we're prepared to do. Both our firms are behind it. You know, my firm and and... and Mike's are, and Doug Wigder is behind it. Well, it's John Aleftirakis and Mike Willem, and I appreciate you guys coming in. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank Brian you guys. ever wants to, you know, retell the story in more, uh, you know, long form. We obviously always have an open door for him to do that. And I appreciate you guys coming in. Thank you for that.